We are going to continue with our series talking about our mission as a church, that this is our missions month, so we need to talk about what our mission is. And uh, we're following through on our series on legit, and we're talking about our legit purpose. What is our real purpose in life? Today we're going to be talking about the title of this message. I have uh, entitled it, Live God's Purpose, Go Beyond. Beyond is CCF's missions department. So you see what I'm doing there, a little clever, you know, twist on the word. But it's not just going beyond as in getting involved with CCF Beyond, but it's going beyond our comfort zone to accomplish the purpose that he has for us. So that's what we want to talk about today. And to understand our purpose, we also need to go back and review what has God called us to as a church. And our purpose, our mission as a church, which we have talked about, let's read this together. It is to honor God and make Christ committed followers who will make Christ committed followers. Is that your mission also? Yes, it's all of our missions. This isn't the mission of Pastor Peter. It's not the mission of the pastors and the elders or even the D group leaders. It is all of our mission. Why is that? Well, because we all need to honor God, right? All of us are to do that. That's not a special position for a pastor or a full-time worker or a staff of CCF or a D group leader. All of us are to honor him. And all of us are to make Christ committed followers who will make Christ committed followers? That's a calling for all of us because we want to honor Jesus. We want to become more like, like Jesus, and we want to bring others to become more like Jesus, and then help them to help others become more like Jesus. Is that okay with you? I think that's what we all should be involved in. Now, the question is, how do we do that? Now, in CCF, of course, we want you to be involved in a D group. We also want you to help start new D groups and reach out to others. That's part of what we are called to because our key verse, what we have been named after for Christ Commission Fellowship, is the Great Commission. And the Great Commission we are familiar with. I think Pastor Ricky mentioned this last week. We talk about it a lot because this is really who we are. It says, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What's the main verb? Is it go? Is it make disciples? Is it baptizing? Is it teaching? Which of these verbs is the main verb? Make disciples. Very good. You know, make disciples is the key thing that God has called us to do. When he spoke to his disciples, he said, make disciples. And then what did he tell them to do? Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. What did he just command them to do? To make disciples. So you may be thinking, oh, wait a minute. This was for Jesus' disciples. This isn't for me. But that's not quite true, because if you look at this carefully, if they are to make disciples and then teach them to observe all that I commanded you, what are the disciples supposed to do? They're supposed to make disciples. And then what are they supposed to teach? They're supposed to teach them to observe everything that I commanded you. You see that anybody that is a follower of Jesus is also commanded to make disciples. But one of the things that sometimes happens when we emphasize a particular part of a verse is that we miss something that's also very important. And I'd like to point out to you, so make disciples is the main verb, but it's to make disciples of all the nations, right? It's not just making disciples in the Philippines. It's not just making disciples here in Manila. It's making disciples of all nations. And so sometimes we skip over this word go because we think, well, we're supposed to make disciples. That's the most important thing. But can you make disciples of all the nations and stay where you are? You can't. I mean, if we all stayed here in Manila, and we never ventured out, we never got involved in what's 
what's happening in the world if we never actually sent missionaries or supported missionaries or got involved in reaching out in other countries, how will the gospel ever get to all the nations? So why do we need to go? We need to go because we won't reach all nations if we stay where we are. And that's the reason that we have Missions Month. That's the reason that we have CCF Beyond, because we want to follow Christ's command, not just to make disciples here, but to make disciples who will ultimately reach the entire world for Jesus. So the key is that we won't reach all nations if we just stay where we are. So that's why the title of this message is Live God's Purpose, Go Beyond. Let's say that together. Live God's Purpose, Go Beyond. Now, where do we get the plan then? Last week, Pastor Ricky talked to us about the plan. How do we go about fulfilling this commandment that God has given to us? And we read this again in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. So, so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. You know, the plan is laid out very clearly by Jesus. He said, you have to wait. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses here and also in Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Now, let me ask you, do you need power to be a witness? How many of you sometimes are fearful or timid when... You have the opportunity to share about Jesus with people, but it's like, uh, I don't know. You ever feel that way? I am fearful. There are times when God gives me the opportunity to share with somebody, and in my mind I'm thinking, oh, they're, they're going to think I'm really weird. Uh, they're going to reject me. You know, maybe they're not interested about God. And ooh. So, so many thoughts go into my mind making me think, you know, maybe I should just keep my, my mouth shut. Don't we need power to be able to overcome those fears, to be able to share with people? Well, you know, if you look at the situation during that time, where were the apostles at that time? Okay, we'll see this in a little bit more clearly, but they were scared to death. You know where they were hiding? They were hiding in the upper room and they had the doors locked. Remember one of the times Jesus came and appeared to them? He actually appeared to them without walking through the door. You know, he just appeared to them. Why? Because the door was locked. He had to actually go through this in an immaterial state because they were so afraid that they were going to be uh, arrested, perhaps also crucified themselves because of association with Jesus. So they were fearful. They were scared. And yet, we all know what happened after the day of Pentecost. When Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit descended, the apostles were emboldened, and Peter, and we know something about Peter, he gets up and he speaks to 3,000 people at least and shares the gospel that he was so afraid to even be associated with Jesus with before. Remember Peter? Was he a really powerful, you know, brave guy? Well, he thought he was until the... the the crucifixion of Jesus, and then even this little slave girl says, wait a minute, aren't you one of the apostles? Didn't you know Jesus? Weren't you one of them? And what does Peter say? Oh, I never knew him. I, I've never been with him. You must be mistaken. You got, got the wrong guy. I didn't know him. You know, here is this guy who only a few days earlier was not even able to, sh to say to a slave girl that he knew Jesus. And then a few days later, he's standing in front of 3,000 people proclaiming that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Now, how does that happen? It happens because of the power of the Holy Spirit that changed his life. That's what we need to be able to be his witnesses, okay? 
So from there, we see that there is a pattern. It says we should be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now, for many of us, we think of this as an either or. Now, either I'm going to be a witness in Jerusalem or I'm going to be a witness in Samaria and Judea or I'm going to be a witness in the remotest parts. I don't know what it's like. We can choose which one. And most of the time what we say is start where you are, right? Start where you are. Now, where are we? We're in Manila. For those of the, that are watching online, you are wherever you are. But we, here in the center, we're in Manila. So we should start among our own friends and relatives, etc. Is that true? Yes. That's the natural place for, for us to start. But it's interesting because it doesn't say you should do that or something else. It's not an either or. Now, I know that some of you haven't had lunch yet, so please forgive me for the next slide. But this is an illustration of an either or, okay? And when I was growing up, we sometimes had uh, dessert in, in our household at, at dinner, but my mom was pretty strict about desserts. And she would say, well, which do you want? Do you want the ice cream or do you want the cake? Okay, now of course, when I was a kid, I wanted both. I didn't want just one or the other. But in our family, either you got the ice cream or you got the cake. So if you got the ice cream, you don't get the cake. If you get the cake, you don't get the ice cream. Get what I'm saying? That's what either or is. But what do we really want? Actually, isn't this what we want? Both and, right? It's both and. Now, I know many of you are thinking about like taking a quick exit and looking for cake. Okay, please wait. My point is very simple though, that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it doesn't say either or. It says, you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. This is both and. We were supposed to go and take the gospel to the ends of the earth, even if we are located here in Manila. How do we do that? We are here. How is it possible for us to also be there? Well, it's very interesting because the fulfillment of that, that uh, order that was given to them by Jesus came only a few days later. When the Holy Spirit descended, remember what happened? You know, the tongues of fire came upon them. They were still hiding in the upper room praying, and then the Holy Spirit came, and then suddenly they were emboldened, and this is what we read. It says, now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each of them was hearing them speak in his own language. Take note of this. In Jerusalem, there were devout men from every nation. And they were hearing them speak in their own languages. From the very moment that the Holy Spirit came, the Great Commission was already being fulfilled to the whole world, not just in Jerusalem. God supernaturally intended that people from every nation would be there to hear the gospel from the very beginning. But the problem was, unfortunately, the apostles didn't get it. They thought that they should just stay in Jerusalem and do the ministry in Jerusalem almost forever. So it's interesting what happened after that. For several years, they continued with the ministry in Jerusalem, never going out, never sending missionaries, never getting involved in Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts, until in Acts chapter 8, God had to shake them up. It says in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, and on that day, this, by the way, is right after Stephen was stoned to death. Remember, Paul was you know, giving his approval. Stephen was stoned to death, and after that, it says, on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. 
It says they went to the regions of Judea and Samaria. Isn't that where they were supposed to go in the beginning? Remember Acts 1.8, you shall be my witness is in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and the remotest parts of the earth, but they got stuck in Jerusalem. That was never God's intention. God's intention was for them to be sent out to reach the entire world. That was what God intended. And they got stuck, and so what did he do? He sent a great persecution on them to push them out. How many of you like to be persecuted? Okay, at least you're honest, or, or maybe you're asleep. I'm not really sure. But, you know, none of us want to be persecuted, right? But sometimes God causes persecution to take place because he needs to get us out of our comfort, comfort zone. I don't think it would be good for us to wait until God gives persecution for us to do what he wants us to do. It's much better that we do it voluntarily. You know, God has blessed us as a church to be able to do exactly that. Over the last few years, God has opened great doors for us to be able to go beyond just here in Manila and in the Philippines to go many other places in the world. And right now, I'd like to invite my friend and colleague. This is my American friend. Uh, notice that I'm like this and he's like that. This is Pastor Danny Perez, who is in charge of our international church planting around the world. Let me share with you what's happening in um, Judea and Samaria. Okay, this is our Judea and Samaria. And um, I'd like to share with you that in ICA, I, ICP, International Church Planting, by His power, by the power of God, we now have 33 satellites all around the world, okay? Amazing. Now, you see, 33 looks small, but if 33 comes up in the last two years, that's mighty awesome, isn't it? You agree? So here's the summary, uh, just to show you how God is moving by His power in our Judea and Samaria. Total satellites. We now have 33 from 15, double in just two years. Total house churches, we now have 31 from six in 2016. That's about five times in the short period of time. Population, how many we are? How many are the persecuted ICP people there? Okay, from 1,600 to about 5,300. That's about, what, three times. That's amazing, isn't it? God is at work, and He is, it's only by His power indeed. Now, we also have discipleship. Uh, by the way, all of these international satellites were born out of the internet, okay? We, ca we call it the internet church, headed by Pastor Joey Geronimo and his group. We now have 154 discipleship D groups all over the world. Hey, we're reaching the remotest part of the earth. You know, um, again, only by His power. But I, I have something to share with you. You know, it was not like this right away. Um, it, it was not like this until we learned to become intentional in our every member a discipler. It's all about being committed to our mission, make disciples. And our mission is every member a discipler. And therefore, if we do that, we will have the power to be able to reach the nations. And like I said, until we learn that. Let me explain. I, I, ha I have been a CCF pastor for a long time, and I, I have been asking this question personally. I ask myself, why is it that not many Christians are not making disciples? Uh, indeed, um, many, many of us are aware of the Great Commission. We repeat it every week here in CCF many are not yet making disciples. I, I was asking that question, why is there no traction about the Great Commission? Uh, I realize that it's not a matter of wanting. I think all of us guys here wants to make disciples, right? Right? You know, but how come we're stuck? And you know what I discovered? There is something missing, and the missing thing is what? The power. We want it, but we lack the power. And, you know, God allowed us to discover how this, this power can, can be availed of. God revealed to us something about discipleship beyond the normal. So what do I mean? My wife and I 
recently discovered when we became really serious about disciple making that discipleship must be intentional. Say the word intentional. Intentional. And for it to become intentional, it must have, for, for us, two things. Number one, it must have true accountability. And accountability is actually really obedience. If you are accountable, you will grow in your obedience to all, all of God's command. And then number two, uh, for it to become really uh, intentional, you, you must be able to experience God's manifest presence and power if you are a discipler. If you're not experiencing the presence and the power of God, then maybe you're doing something wrong. Maybe you're not intentional about it. Maybe you lack exactly the things that needs to happen before the power can come in. Let me explain that. Let's talk about accountability, growing in obedience to all. You know, discipleship will not be complete unless there is accountability, unless there's growing obedience to all. You see that in verse 20. Look at that. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. It's a key component of the Great Commission. And why is it there? Uh, the reason for that is because the disciples are commanded to teach the disciples obedience to all, to grow in obedience. You know what? If you're not obeying, you're not going to change. And if you're not going to change, there's no transformation. And if there's no transformation, hey, we're failing in our discipleship. Because the objective of discipleship is what? To become Christ-like mature. And the key to Christ-like maturity is obedience. Whoa! You know, if we fail to do that, then we will not have the power. And then the next one is this. What is the power that I'm talking about? The power is the greatest benefit, which is God's manifest presence and power. You know, I, I miss this completely. I thought that I had it. But as I was doing, going through my discipleship, I realized that I was not an intentional discipler and that therefore what I have been doing as a discipler has not really been maximized. And so I, I asked myself, what am I missing? You know, look, the greatest benefit, surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The power of Jesus, 24-7, forever. Do you like that? You know, what else do you need? I told myself, there is, if there is one thing that I should have as a discipler, this is it. And you know, the Bible is very clear. Jesus is very clear. Danny, I'm going to give that to you if you are an intentional discipler. Meaning what? You're going to teach them to obey all. After you share the gospel, teach them to obey all. You know what I realized? I was not doing that. And I told myself, oh, you know, I have been teaching them to teach. Oh, yeah, I have been teaching them to know. I have been teaching them to facilitate in a D group. But you know what? What I am missing is teaching them to obey because obey is transformation. I repented. I told myself from now on, I'm going to stop um, just teaching, but teaching people to obey. And the, the, the beautiful things happened. I changed. I was transformed. I, 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 I thought that I was already a, a good salt and, salt and light Christian. But the moment I start to become intentional, and teach my, our disciples, husband and wife, in many places in the world, we discovered that we should model it first. So we discovered that obedience to all is not just teaching, but it's modeling obedience to others. And when that happens, you know what happened to me? I became salt and light, better. Meaning I'm salty, okay? And I am lighty, okay? And when that happens, believe me, our disciples saw that as well, and they started doing it. You know, this young couple, very young, Jeff and Rowan are one of the many salt and light witnesses, disciples we have out there um, in CCF Beyond. And there are hundreds more and even thousands more who are doing this all over the world, making every member a disciple intentionally as we speak. So they, they just became intentional because they experienced the joy of God bringing the harvest. And um, let me show you some pictures. You know, this, these are people doing discipleship all over Canada. They, they meet people couple to couple, men to men, women to women, 
uh, through, through the Skype and through the internet. These are uh, some disciples we have in the USA, and these are disciples we have in uh, the Middle East, in Kuwait, and here, for example, is uh, Vaughn and Meg in, in, in Hong Kong. Um, this is just a one-year company, uh, sorry, uh, ICP satellite, and they've been already multiplying in a big way. Um, clearly, salt and light witnesses like these people, I call them salt shakers and lighthouses. You know, folks, they are not born. They are made. And they are made through intentional discipleship. When they share the gospel and when they learn how to grow in obedience to all, they experience the joy of God's presence. They are favored and they become excited in what they're doing. So in ICP, we are committed to this purpose. We know our legit purpose very clearly, to intentionally disciple the Filipinos abroad so they will be salt and light witnesses who make disciples of all nations beyond the Philippines. But you know what? We're not there yet. The harvest is still plentiful. And we'd like to have people like you. We want to challenge you to become part of it. Because the people who are making disciples that I know have really experienced the joy of the God's presence. I know of one person, for example, a young guy from Canada. He learned that discipleship must be intentional. He liked the idea of God's presence. So after the training, he approached us. How can I disciple? Well, very simple. Go home, pray, and share the gospel to your family members. Whoa, he said. Yeah, uh, but before that, I said, make sure that you are Christ-like in your behavior. That was a weekend, weekday. That weekend, he brought his younger sister to church in Canada. We shared the gospel with his sister, and she became a Christian. And two months ago, the parents of this man joined us in the true life, and their parents were baptized. You know what I call that? I call that the abiding presence of God in the intentional disciples. You know, and that happened to me very, very realistically. I don't have the time to share with you how, how awesome this, this, this uh, presence of God is when you become committed to really make disciples intentionally. Um, I, I, when, I, when I heard the gospel, I brought my, my brother right away to the uh, Bible study that Pastor Peter is doing. He heard the gospel that was in the garage in San Juan 34 years ago. By the way, it's an, our anniversary next, next, next week. And nothing happened. He just went on with his life. And then I brought my three other brothers to a true life retreat in Clark, um, and they were baptized. But I was following them up. Nothing happened. Okay? Um, you know, it's like, wow, where is, what's going on here? I, I just moved on. But recently, because of our discovery about um, God's power and God's promise. You know, as I got back here three weeks ago, my sister, I realize, is now a regular ccf -er in Alabang. My brother is attending Makati, CCF Makati, and the other one is from Robinson. And you know what they said? Danny, can we come together as a family and have a Bible study? My, my God, where, where is this coming from? And they are pulling all of a sudden. And last, last Saturday, uh, to, uh, we had our whole family together with their nieces, together with my nieces and my my, my nephews, we had one big Bible study. Can you believe that? Okay, only because of the presence of God. And then, uh, finally, okay, I had a reunion with my marketing group. I used to be the head of Sarali Philippines. So all of my marketing people, um, some of them called me and said, let's have a reunion. And then I said, why? Just come. So I came and they started asking me how I became from a very difficult boss to a pastor, okay? And so I told them, hey, I changed. I, I told my story. They were touched. And because of that, you know, all of them requested that why don't you gather us and have a Bible study soon? On September 1, we will have another one, okay? And that to me is the abiding presence of God. So folks, we're not there yet. The harvest is plentiful. We need you. Our target for 2020 is big. Look at this, 33 satellites today. We want to be 60, 20, 20, double. Our D groups must be uh, four times, and our members double. Will you join us? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We need you. Join us, disciple the nations, and together let us live God's purpose to be salt and light witnesses and experience His blessing as all of us did, His manifest 
power in you and all of us. God bless you. Thanks, man. Thanks, Pastor Danny. Isn't that exciting? It's amazing to see what God is doing when we just surrender to obey the way that God wants us to, to do. So uh, if we continue, what we were talking about was it took the church in Jerusalem a while before they actually went to Judea and Samaria. He had to cause persecution to come upon them. Well, they continued doing the same thing. And actually, they didn't go beyond Judea and Samaria. In fact, for another more than 10 years, we don't see any evidence that the church went to the ends of the earth, not until Acts chapter 13. So in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, it says, Now there were in Antioch, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Ma uh, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Notice the guys that were there at the church. These guys were not mainly from Jerusalem. They were actually internationals. They were from North Africa. They were from Asia Minor. They were even people that were brought up in the Roman uh, king's palace. I mean, these were guys that were very unique. And these were the ones that in a prayer meeting, God called them to be involved in missions. So while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. At that point, they chose the cream of the cream. They chose Paul and Barnabas to be the first missionaries to go outside of Judea and Samaria and sent them to Asia Minor, eventually to Europe, and that was the beginning of the spread of the gospel to the rest of the world. Now, it's very interesting that it wasn't the normal people in Jerusalem that did it. It was guys that were already out in the field, people from different backgrounds. You realize that we have Filipinos all over the world that are perfectly placed to be able to be missionaries for the Lord. Isn't it an amazing thing how God has sent Filipinos everywhere to be able to make an impact for Him? We're trying to capitalize on that. But another thing that we are doing is we're also training people that are national leaders to be able to do what God wants them to do by making disciples among their own people. Think about it. Paul, when he was sent as a missionary, where was he sent? He was sent from Antioch, which was Judea and Samaria. He went back to the same place where he was born, in Asia Minor. Tarsus was actually part of what is now Turkey. He also went to the Roman Empire. What was uh, Paul? Wasn't he a Roman citizen? So it's interesting that God raised up somebody and actually sent him back to his own people to be able to start the mission of God. And in a way, that's what we are doing in, um, in CCF Beyond. Now, I want to show you just a quick video to tell you the scope of what CCF Beyond is doing. So let's watch this. The Lord reaches far down on this ever-changing world where families are pulled apart, where workers are few, when nations are becoming increasingly hostile. How do we move with God in reaching peoples for Jesus in this ever-changing world? We need to think out of the box. We need to go beyond. In CCF Beyond, we think outside the box. With Skypleship, we use technology as a tool to reach those outside the Philippines where there's no CCF satellite. We build connections to make disciples through video calls and online chats. With international church planting, CCF now has satellites across the globe where people can experience face-to-face -face discipleship that continues to transform lives by His Spirit and for His glory. With international partnerships, we work together with local leaders who share our heart and vision for disciple-making. In those hard-to-reach countries, we train people to share Jesus to their countrymen and multiply house churches and D groups. The work is far from done. Every little bit counts. A prayer to God, a single click, a small amount of your pay. There are so many ways you can help.
help you be part of something bigger. A global community of Christ committed followers who make Christ committed followers. Think out of the box. Go beyond. So that's a picture of what the kind of totality of what Beyond is doing. But let me give you, as Pastor Danny already showed some, some of our statistics of what is going on. So we've already seen that in ICP, if you combine that to what we're doing with Skypleship, we already have about a thousand D groups and uh, no house church, a few house churches, but mainly D groups all across the globe. But we're also working in other places in East Asia. Now, I can't tell you where these places are because security issues, but think of a really big country that produces almost all the things that you buy in the store, okay? Got that? Figure that one out. So East Asia, we have around 1,500 D groups that have been started over the last several years. People that have taken the same DNA that we have and applied it in their own context. Imagine more than 1,500 D groups in that area of the world. We also have missionary partners that we are working together with in other parts of Southeast Asia and South Asia. We'll show you a few pictures and a few stories. 650 house churches and small groups that have been started. In South Asia, this is where God has done some incredible things. We're working with partners in South Asia, and again, think of a very large country with lots and lots of people, but I can't tell you the name of it, in South Asia, and it's not the East Asia one. So there's two of those. You got it? Or got the picture? More than 14,000 house churches and small groups that have been started in the last 10 years through partnerships that we are participating uh, in. And most recently, we just started in East Asia. This is an area where it is predominantly from the M background. They are not believers, very hostile to the gospel. But over the last several months, we've already seen more than 80 new house churches started in that area. Isn't God amazing? We have the privilege as a church. Yeah, you can give them a round of applause. We have the privilege as a church to be able to be involved in what God is doing in some of the most difficult places in the world and yet seeing incredible fruit as a result. Now, let me just tell you a few stories that help us to make this a little bit more personal. Uh, we started doing training several years ago in a, a Southeast Asian country that is communist, that is very hostile to the gospel. Uh, during one of the trainings, there was a guy who was a pharmacist that attended the training. And we trained them how to do prayer care share, just like we do here, find people of peace, eventually start a discipleship group, which then eventually becomes a house church. And then they train leaders who start other house churches. So this pharmacist came to the training. And uh, when he was there, he really caught the vision of doing prayer care share. And he thought, what better way to start than to start sharing the gospel with my customers? So he shared the gospel over a two-month period with about 36 of his customers. 24 of them received Christ into their lives. Now understand, this is a very difficult place, and yet God gave him amazing fruit. Now he has his own house church. This pharmacist is now a pastor leading a house church in this place. Over the last, what, 18 months in that country, they have seen more than 320 house churches established uh, in a persecuted minority situation. And to let you know how persecuted it is, this couple with their two young kids came to know Christ just a couple months ago. After they came to know Christ, they were literally kicked out of their village. Their house was destroyed. They are living in a tent outside of the town now because they have become Christians and th their neighbors didn't like it. Imagine, wouldn't you be considering, maybe I should just renounce my faith? But they're not. They are continuing to follow Christ, and they are being trained themselves to be able to reach out to others as well. Another place I mentioned to you in East Asia, the big country that manufactures all of our stuff, we did training about five years ago. First training that we did was in coordination with another organization that you may know, CREW or CCC. 
Um, when we did it, we were introducing the training, which is actually a four-phase training. And there was about 40 people that went to the training, teaching them how to multiply house churches. And there was one lady that was there, and uh, she went through the first phase of the training, and then we lost track of her. Uh, we didn't have any contact with her. She went back to her, her province, and we didn't know what happened. Well, last year, a friend of mine said that they ran into her. And she hasn't had all of the training, but what she learned, she applied, as well as other Campus Crusade training that she had received. You know how many house churches she now has in her downline network after four years? Any guesses? She has 800 downline churches. If you can imagine. <clears throat> and you would think, well, 800, wow, that's huge. Maybe she's happy with that. No, she's not happy with it. She has a goal by the end of 2020 to have at least 20,000 house churches in her province. Isn't that amazing? So here's one lady who caught a vision, who we've been able to help influence. Now we're coming alongside, helping her to grow her network just to be able to see the kingdom expanded in places like this. Another place, as I mentioned, South Asia, that God is doing great things. This is a very typical house church. I've been in a number of places like this where God is just doing amazing things. If you would ask almost anybody in this house church, did you know who Jesus was before somebody came and shared the gospel with you? Almost 100% of the time, they would say, we had never even heard of Jesus Christ. We didn't know who he was. How did they come to know Christ? Many of them, they worship many other gods, but their gods don't answer their prayers. And so when they meet somebody that's a Christian that says, I will pray for you, can I pray for you? They say, okay, well, if your God will answer my prayers, they don't care. Whoever it is that will answer the prayer, that's good enough for them. So sure, go ahead and pray. And we have seen people whose family members have been healed, we have seen people who couldn't have children. Now they can have children. We've seen miracles take place. People who were, were demon-possessed that have been freed. And that's the reason when they see the power of God working in people's lives and the reality that Jesus is more powerful than their gods, they want to know Jesus too. I'd like to show a video right now of just one couple, one family that has seen that take place in their lives. यीशु मसीह को तो हम जानते थे मगर विश्वास नहीं करते थे तो हमारा जीवन छिन्नभिन्न था डमाडोल था क्योंकि वो बुरी आत्माओं से पीड़ित थी मेरी पत्नी मैंने सुना कि ये यीशु मसीह के नाम से और ये भाग जाती हैं बहुत बेकार था मैं तो बिल्कुल मन ही नहीं लगता था परेशानी बहुत थी तो इसलिए मैं वो हमेशा गुस्से में थी और विष करती थी लड़ाई झगड़ा होता रहता उन परिवार में बहुत दुख और कष्ट है उन्होंने सोचा कि वो मर जाएगी इतफाक से हम एक दिन पार्टर ग्रीन जोन से गए थे तो इस बारे में चर्चा होने लगी तब बोला कि मेरे घर पे आना वहाँ पे इस मसीह का तो सब सही हो जाएगा इस मसीह जी के पास है मेरी तबीयत सही हो गई घर में सुख शांति आ गई घर में तो इसलिए मैंने इस मसीह से देखा मेरे साथ है मेरे परिवार का भी साथ बना और हम उसमें पूरे विश्वास के साथ We can share story after story after story. Imagine 14,000 house churches and small groups. If there are, say, 20 on average in each of the house churches, which is a pretty reasonable estimate, that's nearly 300,000 people just like them that have seen God change their lives and transform their whole perspective on life. It's amazing that we have the privilege to be a part of that. Now, the most recent place that we've started to work 
is in an East African country that has been devastated by war for the last 15 years. Uh, it's a very pitiful place. In fact, it's probably the poorest place I've ever seen in my life. Um, we have come in contact with people that are believers there that say that they still believe that the reason they have gone through this is to prepare the land for something that God wants them to do. When we talk with them, we are just amazed that in spite of the, or the problems that they've had, the famine, bombings from you know, their enemies, all of these things that they have experienced, yet they still believe that God is preparing them for something very, very special. Uh, this picture shows a training batch, the first training batch of people that are going through our church multiplication training. And uh, when they come, so there's about 45 of them, we tell them, before you can come back to the next phase in about three months, you need to share the gospel, practice prayer, care, share, find people of peace, begin a follow-up group of new believers, and form that into a group that meets on a regular basis before you can come back in three months. Okay, now imagine this is, I'll say it straight up, this is in a Muslim area. The vast majority of people here are not from a Christian background. I think 90% are from a Muslim background. And there are Muslim missionaries to Muslim countries that I know that have been doing this for 15, 20 years and never even see one person come to know Christ because it's so difficult to share the gospel. And yet, in the last three months of this group, out of the 45 that went, 37 or 38 of them came back after three months saying that we now have a group of new believers that has been formed. Isn't that amazing what God is doing? There was one of the members of this group that he was from another refugee camp, and we're doing this in a refugee camp, and uh, he is from a refugee camp several hours away. And so he went back, and he wanted to bring some other people from his camp to this camp, but it was too dangerous. He was the only one that was allowed to go. And so when he went back, he echoed the training. And if you can imagine even echoing the training, he saw 10 new groups started through his disciples in just two months. And 130 people have come to know Christ. Well, one of the groups, a house church, is already up to almost 40 members in two months in an area where the gospel is usually very, very difficult to share. Uh, the last time we went back, we had some difficulty getting to the place where we were going uh, because transportation is very difficult. We got there late because the transportation is very difficult. And when we got to the, the training place, which is a, a very simple church, <clears throat> on the outside, there was just dirt. And then we saw these smoldering embers, like a little bonfire that had been burning. And it was kind of weird because you don't really think about a bonfire when it's 39 degrees. I mean, it's just too hot. So why do you need a bonfire? So I asked one of the guys, what is this pile of stuff that's burning? And so he told me a story which was really touched my heart. He said they had been waiting for us to come, and so they wanted to maximize their time. And so a couple of the guys during the morning break, they just went around into some of the other areas of this camp, and they approached these women that were next to a tent, and these women were at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning already drinking alcohol and you know, they were not your most reputable type people. But they still felt the Lord wanted them to share the gospel with these ladies. And so they started sharing about Jesus and about how God loves them and can forgive them. And one of the ladies responded and said, can, can your God even forgive us? I mean, you see what we're like. Can your God even love and accept us? And the answer was yes. He said, yes, our God is a God of mercy and a God of, of, of forgiveness. And so he shared the gospel, and three of these women prayed to receive Christ into their lives. But that wasn't all. They were so committed. They wanted to make a clear break from their previous lifestyle. And these ladies were actual, actually spiritists. They used to do you know, faith healing and all kinds of other things, have incantations to put curses on people, 
all of that. So they had all of this paraphernalia, and they said, we want to get rid of all of this. What can we do? And so the, the guy that shared with them said, why don't you bring all of that stuff to the church, and let's burn it. So this little pile of smoldering embers were all of their amulets, all of their magic potions, all of the things that they used to use, and that was their source of livelihood. And they decided that they were going to burn it because they wanted to follow Jesus. Uh, one of the guys that is kind of the, the most senior and most respected leader actually lives up in the mountains about maybe eight to 10 hours away. And it's very difficult to get up there, difficult to get around. But this guy is so passionate about wanting to share the gospel with people. And they're all in that area, all from Muslim background. And so it's very difficult. But one of the tools that he has is an audio Bible. It's a little instrument that uh, is, it's not even battery operated, it's solar operated because there's no electricity there. And so you can play the Bible in Arabic on this little player and you can gather people together or they can listen like an MP3 player. So he, was, he has only one of these and he gave it to a guy in the community, a Muslim, and said, you should listen to this. It tells a story that you need to hear. And so this guy took it with him and he listened to it. And after he had listened and, and heard the message of the gospel from the Bible, he came back to my friend and he said, you need to get more of these things so everybody in our community can hear this message. He said, if you don't give us this so that everyone can hear this message, God is going to hold you accountable. Imagine this Muslim guy telling my friend, if you don't share the gospel, if you don't give us these players so that we can hear this message, God will hold you accountable. You know, we are privileged to be able to be involved as a church in amazing things that God is doing around the world. This isn't just about a few people that are doing this. This is about all of us. We are to be involved because we are to live God's purpose. We are to go beyond. But the question is, what is our response? What should we do? How should we individually respond? How will you respond? And I'd like to suggest that there's three ways that we can respond. First, we can pray. All of us have the privilege of going beyond borders through prayer. There is no boundary that you cannot cross by praying for people. You know, we send out on a regular basis prayer requests for people that are now under persecution and under threat of being potentially uh, arrested and put into prison for five years. We pray for people that are going through difficulties, that are, you know, undergoing persecution, or perhaps people that are just given opportunities that they want God to work in a very special way. We pray for them on a regular basis. We would love to send prayer requests to you so that you can join us in praying for them. We also have many opportunities to connect. What Pastor Danny said earlier, you probably have friends that are living in other countries, maybe relatives that have migrated or relatives that are working as OFWs. Connect them either through Skypeship or to our local satellites. Or perhaps you yourself are a person that is going to be going. We encourage you to connect with us so that we can make sure that you are discipled and make disciples wherever it is that God has called you. Another way to connect is to go on a short-term mission trip. If you would like to actually participate in some of these countries, to be able to contribute your gifts and your abilities through a short-term mission, that's another option. And something that I'd like to challenge, especially the young people here, perhaps you would like to someday consider yourself becoming a missionary or going abroad. You know, we would encourage you, consider giving two years of your life right after college to serving the Lord. We will train you, get you involved in Elevate, and ultimately give you opportunities potentially to serve as missionaries abroad. If you would like to do that, that's something that we encourage you to do. And finally, 
we encourage you to give. We can't do this with no money. Uh, all of the resources that are given to CCF Beyond go into doing all of the training that has resulted in this incredible harvest that God is doing among us. But we need your help. Now, I'd like you to do something right now, something that we don't do very often, but I want you to do as we are closing the session. I want you to get out your chronicle. You will see an interesting thing in your chronicle. It's a commitment sheet that we want you to fill out right now. If God has spoken to you, if God has touched your heart and you said, you know, Pastor Jim, I know that I can do more than what I am doing right now, and I want to commit. I want you to fill this out. If you have a pencil, you can do that now. Put your name, your email address, your mobile number, and then say, by the grace of God, I will pray. I commit to pray for beyond on a regular basis. If that's true for you, just tick that box. If you want to connect, you want to volunteer to lead a discipleship group, uh, tick that one. If you want to connect friends or loved one, ones who are living overseas to either Skypleship or to a CCF satellite, you can tick that. If you want to apply to be part of a short-term mission trip, you can tick that. And if you want to be one of those to, that will give two years of your life straight out of college or whenever to consider being a future missionary, just indicate that under the I will apply to join a short-term mission trip. And finally, if God has blessed you to be able to bless others outside of the Philippines so that we can expand the gospel in places that are most difficult and you would like to give towards CCF Beyond, we encourage you to check the last. If you would like to give on a monthly basis, you can. If you would like to give one-time gift, that's great. Whatever it is that the Lord leads you to do, please check that and then indicate the amount that you would like to give. And I'll give you just a couple minutes now just to prayerfully consider what should be your response right now. Praise God. Are you excited? I'm going to ask the CCFBN team led by Pastor Jim and his wife, please come up here, and uh, Danny Perez and his wife, Head of International Church Planting, please come up here. And Pastor Joey Geronimo and his wife, Jean, they are in charge of the Internet Church Discipleship. We really need a lot of volunteers to do discipleship. You know what is discipleship? You speak through the computer, long distance connection. And I want to ask Pastor Wilson Gonzalez and his wife to come up here. Those of you who are burdened to go to East Asia, Mandarin speaking, where you shop all the time, uh, that's Pastor Wilson. And Mel Santos and his wife, Mel, will you please come up here? And then may I ask the entire uh, CCF uh, Beyond team who are based in Manila to come up here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, do you know why we do what we do? Do you know why we do what we do? Can I tell you? Now, all of these guys, I want to motivate you. This is something you have never heard before because Jim has not yet used this verse. But I'm going to use this verse for all of us. You got to know why we do what we do. Amen? All right. Why do we do what we do? Everybody, let's read this together. Together. So that they will hear. Ready? Go. Romans 10, 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. In other words, whatever hope you have in your life, God is giving you a promise. In Jesus, you will never be disappointed. What in the world does that mean? Read the next verse. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the, what we are discussing with you has to do with eternal destiny of humanity. Save or not save. Two kinds of people in this world, two kinds of people in this room. Saved or not saved? Ask your neighbor, are you saved? Only two kinds of people, saved or not saved. And who knows who are saved and who knows who are not saved? Only three beings know. 
Number one, God knows whether you are saved or not saved. Number two, Satan knows whether you are saved or not saved. And number three, you yourself know whether you are saved or not saved. I cannot tell. But that is what is at stake. Saved or not saved. But then the Bible continues. Everybody read. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How? So tell me how. If nobody ever shared with you, how in the world will you hear? And the Bible tells us, how will they preach unless they are sent? Huh. What's required? Manpower, financial resources, training. And CCF is involved in all of the above. Just as it is written, everybody, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of glad tidings. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know that 40% of the world's population live in regions where there are no churches and evangelical gospel in their culture? 40% as of today of the world's population live in places where there are no churches that they can go to. Huh. You will ask me, where are these people? Let me tell you. Have you heard of the 1040 window? 1040 window is right in this area. 10 degrees latitude north, 40 degrees south. Look at the map. These are the places where no access to the gospel. From Northern Africa, Middle East, India, Malaysia, China, and other places there. But do you know this something about the Philippines? You know why? Let me tell you why. 90% of the world's unreached people live in the 1040 window. In other words, 90% of those people who don't have access to the gospel live in the 1040 window. But the most amazing thing, the Philippines is the only Christian nation in that 1040 window. Is that amazing? And why do you think the Philippines was placed there by God in this 1040 window where 90% of the world's unreached people are residing? These are the major religions of the world. Hinduism, Muslim, Buddhism. These are the predominant religion. But in this area, there's a country called the Philippines. In this small country, there is a group of people who are part of CCF. And God is telling you guys, we are not here for ourselves. God has called us to an amazing mission. I like you folks to think, to do something that will outlast your life. And I want you all to get involved in discipleship. From now on, you have no more excuses. I've told you the truth. Without Jesus, people are lost. And they cannot come to Jesus if nobody ever does them. And that is why we do what we do. Are you ready? So why don't you all stand up? Let's pray for these people. And for these people, I have a verse for all of you. You know the verse I'm going to give you? It's found in John 15, 16. So everybody, let's read this for all of us. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit would remain. The only way the fruit will remain is to plant churches. Let me repeat. It's one thing to bear fruit. How do you preserve the fruit? How do you multiply the fruit? It's called discipleship. Discipleship happens when people are part of a church, when they are part of a community. I'm so excited to be part of CCF. Are you? What a privilege. Now, what will you do next Sunday? Next Sunday, you are going to bring your friends. Throughout all our satellites all over the world, we will celebrate our 34th anniversary. You must bring your friend. Lord willing, they don't know the Lord yet. Bring them here and pray for me. Let's all raise our right hand. Okay, two hands better. Let's pray for all of these great men and women of God. By the way, all of you, I want to thank you from my heart for all your commitment. We are a team. Amen? Praise God for these people. <laughs> Father God in heaven, what a joy it is that you have called us 
and given us the privilege of sharing the most amazing news, that you love us, and you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross, and you rose again from the dead to prove that you are the Savior, the Messiah, and the Son of the living God. Help us not to be ashamed of this message. And above all, help us to be salt and light. Help us to be good examples of becoming your, of being your followers in our home, in our office, in our schools. Let us not bring shame, Lord, to your name. And we are weak. We need your strength. So I now pray for the leadership of Jim, Danny, and the rest of the team. Amen. Fill them with your spirit. And above all, raise up many more workers. Raise up many more volunteers to heed the call, to be salt and light, to be a witnesses from the Philippines to the regions beyond, from our home to our offices to our school to all over the Philippines. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.